good. It seems to me that we can begin the last part of this first day. And let me introduce in particular for those of uh, you who come from outside our university, our next speaker, who is Professor Roberto Accolla. Uh, um, Professor Accolla took his degree in, the, in uh, medical sciences at, in Rome, in uh, La, La Sapienza, and then he was postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania studying uh, uh, just the acquired uh, response and in particular the B-cell uh, response and then he was also fellow at the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research in Lausanne in Switzerland and then he became professor in Italy, professor of pathology uh, first at the University of Verona and then in our university, the University of Insubria, where he is now professor of general pathology in the Faculty of Medicine. His main uh, uh, research interests uh, deal with basic uh, uh, and uh, applied and clinical immunology, and in particular, he did a lot of work on the general regulation of the immune response, and uh, uh, in particular, on the regulation of the major histocompatibility complex genes. He did some seminal works, in particular, on the regulation uh, on uh, MHC class two molecular um, aspects which are relevant for both the antiviral immune response and uh, uh, presently is working on another very big implication of this kind of studies, which is tumor vaccination. And this is exactly what he will uh, uh, talk about uh, in this lecture. So uh, I'm very pleased to invite uh, uh, Professor Arcolo to give uh, his lecture in this course. Thank you very much, Roberto, please. Thank you, Marco and uh, Franca, for this uh, invitation. That invitation is not, in fact, because we, we work so close together that uh, I prefer to, to think to a sort of uh, sharing collaboration in discussing what I will discuss today with you. Um, as you will see from what I, I would say, uh, uh, my, uh, my argument would be more concentrated or on single aspects of uh, uh, of biological reaction with respect to what Sauber said before as an holistic uh, view of uh, biology. <clears throat> we are interested in, uh, uh, in immunology essentially and in immunopathology in particular and we are trying to apply what we knew and what we know, what is our experience of more than unfortunately more than 30 years of uh, working in this subject now on uh, clinical applications if we hope. Uh, and I will start with the, the, uh, one of our major interests in the lab, which is in fact uh, tumor immunology, and uh, trying to tell you with, what is our view on the basic aspect of tumor immunology and how we can, through these aspects, maybe uh, support the basic information for application to therapy. So you know that there are several, uh, many modalities for cancer treatment. Uh, the best and the still most useful modality is surgical oncology. Because uh, if you take out the tumor from the body, then uh, everything goes better. Uh, then you have radiation oncology, chemotherapy agents, biotherapeutics, which is new, a new entry, in fact. Uh, biotherapeutics uh, has been always dreamed for many years, for many uh, uh, decades, but it became a reality only 20 years ago, I would say. Endocrine therapy and gene therapy are also the other modalities for cancer treatment that are used uh, almost uh, regularly now. So in terms of biotherapeutics, there are several uh, sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, avenues that you can take to use it. Uh, and these are all the possibilities that uh, you can apply for the biotherapeutics in order to treat, at least not to prevent, but to treat cancer. The only uh, procedure that uh, includes in itself uh, prevention and therapy possibly would be vaccination against cancer. And I will concentrate on this aspect uh, to tell you what is our experience on that. Now, <clears throat> we have to start with this uh, uh, fantastic cartoons that everybody likes to show when uh, speaks about uh, uh, immunology, biology, neurology, neuroscience in general. 
This is a very, very simplified uh, view of what uh, immunology is, uh, the, immu the immune response is, in its basic terms. We have uh, uh, what we call natural immune response, which is basically under the government of uh, three cells. One is macrophages, the other ones are the polymorphonucleates or granulocytes, and the other ones are NK, natural killer cells. These are the three major cells that uh, control the innate immunity. There are also other variations, other cells that could be, uh, could be involved in the process, but these are what we believe are the major, uh, the major player. Now, but these are not separate player from what is the real uh, uh, classical adaptive immune response. As adaptive immune response, we, we mean uh, those responses which have uh, two main characteristics. One is the specificity, so they can recognize uh, number one among a number hundred different things. And the other one is memory. Memory means that once you have encountered one antigen, a specific antigen, then subsequently you, you retain memory of this antigen. When the antigen is uh, represented to the immune system, then you get a much better, much stronger immune response. This adaptive immune response is under the government essentially of uh, three cells, three cell types. One is shared between natural and adaptive immunity, and these are the antigen-presenting cells, which can be macrophages, but also dendritic cells. The other ones are the T helper cells, and these are the cells that we draw atten our attention in this talk uh, for, uh, for today. T helper cells are fundamental to trigger all the effector phases of immune response, effector mechanism of immune response. And these are basically the B cells, which make antibodies. And these are the most recognized and useful, and useful in the present time uh, effector molecules because the antibodies are those which neutralize the pathogens. And the other very important cells of the effector phase are the CTL, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Cytotoxic T lymphocytes, like NK, kill target cells. But when they kill target cells, they do it in a specific way, a specific way by recognizing antigen presented by specific molecules. Now, uh, those molecules which are absolutely required for starting an adaptive immune response among these partner cells are the MHC molecules. MHC stop for, stays for major histocompatibility complex. This major histocompatibility complex encodes almost 200 different genes. Most, some of them, uh, a dozen of them, let's say 20 genes uh, uh, within the major histocompatibility complex are polymorphic in the sense that they code, they, uh, they code for molecules which uh, are different in terms of sequence between different individuals, and this indeed is the most polymorphic system that we know. And they are composed essentially of two families. One is called MHC class two, and is expressed in a relatively restricted way. Only certain cells can express class two, like for example, dendritic cells and macrophages and B cells. And the other molecules uh, of the major histocompatibility complex, polymorphic molecules are the MHC class one, which instead are expressed on all, on virtually all cells of the body. MHC class one restrict the response of CTL, whereas MHC class two restrict the response of the, of the controller cells of the immune system, which is the T helper cell. Only the antigen, any kind of antigen that you uh, take contact with uh, during your life, which produces an adaptive immune response can do it only if this antigen is presented by MHC class two molecules. Because uh, MHC class two molecules by presenting these peptides trigger the T helper cells and the T helper cell can trigger all the other responses. So now what's the problem? Uh, the problem is that when we consider an antigen in general, we consider a pathogen, okay? Pathogen like bacteria, like viruses, all those sorts of things. And in order to respond very well and eliminate, as, uh, uh, as Straub was saying before, the antigen, you have a very short threshold of time. Uh, otherwise, you get either killed by the pathogen or you get a chronic uh, infection. And this time is about uh, 
20 days, between 20 to 40 days, exactly uh, f uh, falling down in the scheme that uh, Rainer Strober was, uh, uh, was uh, showing before. Now, in order to do a perfect immune response against pathogen, you need the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. They both collaborate to eliminate the pathogen. Now, what happens when you deal with tumor cells? Tumor cells are not pathogens, but if you think or if you imagine that against tumor cells you may produce an immune response and that immune response can be useful to produce a vaccine or to produce uh, therapeutic modalities in uh, any way, then you have to include tumor cells into the scheme uh, because they have to produce an immune response. So first of all, we, we have to know whether tumor cells can produce an immune response. And second of all, we have to know whether an adaptive immune response can be produced against tumor cells. Otherwise, we cannot, we cannot, be, uh, 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 we cannot, be, we cannot destroy totally the tumor cells. The innate immune system, like uh, in bacteria and viral infection, alone cannot destroy the infection. So. <clears throat> Can we really think to a tumor cell like a bacterial antigen? And if we think uh, tumor cells like a bacterial antigen or a, a viral antigen, then we should know whether these sort of responses can be mounted, okay? Uh, so there are two ways to deal with tumor immunology problem uh, in terms of vaccination. First of all, uh, we have to think whether the tumor vaccination is conceivable. In other words, as I said, uh, can an immune response against tumor be demonstrated in vivo? And the other thing is, uh, if we can demonstrate an immune response, then we should, uh, uh, how should the tumor vaccine be constructed? Can we construct a tumor vaccine like a bacterial vaccine, like a viral vaccine, as we are used to, uh, to think uh, in nowadays? For example, we know that if we get vaccinated against polio, we don't get polio. If we get vaccinated against rubella, we don't get rubella, and so on. So can we get vaccinated against cancer and don't get cancer? Uh, that's the basic question. <clears throat> what, we know, what do we know about tumor immunity? Okay. Uh, uh, are, for example, tumor antigen existing or not? And uh, we now know the tumor-associated antigen exists and usually are derived from mutated or abnormally expressed proteins, self-proteins, of course, because we get the tumor in our body. We know that peptides from tumor-associated antigen can be recognized by specific CTL. Very little about uh, uh, humoral immunity. Uh, humoral immunity maybe doesn't play such an important role like CTL play in tumor immunity. But uh, we know that tumor antigen can be recognized by CTL through presentation via MHC class one molecule. In this exception, tumor cells behave like uh, virus infected cells. I'm not going to, 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 to make a lecture on immunity, but you have to know, of course, that uh, in order to eliminate completely a viral infection, you don't need only antibodies that uh, impede, that uh, amper, that uh, uh, prevent uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, virus to get into the cells. But you need also to eliminate viral infected cells because these are the reservoir for viral uh, spreading in the body. So you have to kill those cells. In order to kill viral infected cells, the only way you have is through CTL. What we know, again, against, uh, uh, for tumor immunity, we know that humoral immune response are generally weak and non-protective. We know that NK cells, which are another kind of, uh, uh, of uh, killer cells, uh, play an important role. We still do not appreciate very, very much what is the importance of NK cells, but we know that they play a role. And we know that certain cytokines exert a potent adjuvant effect against the tumor. That's what we know about, uh, for tumor immunology. So <clears throat> if uh, we have to eliminate the tumor, the only way we have, since the tumor is not a bacteria, and since we know that uh, uh, humoral immunity, antibody-mediated immunity, doesn't play a very, very important role, is to, uh, uh, to uh, believe that the only way we have to eliminate it is through CTL, through cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Now, uh, 
what we have discovered uh, over, over the last uh, 15 years. We have discovered that uh, in patients and in experimental animals that have tumors, you can demonstrate the existence of CTL. You can demonstrate the specificity of this CTL. In other words, you, you, you demonstrate the, what, what it is the specific antigen they recognize on the tumor cells, on the tumor target cells. Uh, but we have also tried, many people, uh, especially in the United States, have tried, and in Belgium and in Europe, uh, have tried to produce vaccines with these peptides, vaccines which are targeted for CTL, of course. But unfortunately, uh, uh, we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't produce a, a potent vaccine. In other words, although CTL are present, although peptides can be isolated, although specificity can be demonstrated in vivo, CTL cannot do the job, cannot eliminate the tumor. And the fact in itself that the tumor grow, uh, the tumor grow in a patient, is a demonstration that the tumor immunity fails in those cases. So why, for example, although CTL are considered the major effectors on immunity against tumor, uh, uh, in vivo there is a failure, a failure of immune response against tumor cells? Now, uh, many people believe and agree that this failure in uh, uh, producing a strong anti-tumor immunity by CTL is not due to CTL, but is due to this specific mechanism. It's due to the previous mechanism that would trigger CTL against the tumor. In other words, it's due to a defect in this antigen presentation and T-helper uh, stimulation. Because, uh, as you have said before, and as you've seen before, and uh, as everybody agrees, if you don't have enough T-help, you don't have enough CTL. And even if you have enough number of CTL, if you don't continually supply helper by T-helper cells, this CTL will not be amplified and will not stay for longer, for longer time, in order to eliminate the tumor. So uh, a lot of concentration has been uh, focused in this particular step of tumor immunity in the last 10 years to respond to the question, to answer the question why and how we cannot excitate, we cannot uh, uh, accelerate the stimulation of the helper cells. And I will give you some example which will, uh, will provide not certainly an answer, but an indication that uh, uh, we don't get an, a strong anti-tumor immunity because we don't get a stronger antigen presentation against the tumor, these antigens. Now, <clears throat> why T helper cells are ineffective? If this is the reason, why T helper cells are ineffective against cancer, okay? Uh, which is the same as saying a weak activation of tumor specific CTL. Well, one possibility is that, C that these specific tumor helper, helper T cells have low avidity and potency against tumor antigens, so this is conceivable. Uh, possibility since tumor antigens are self-antigens, so you are not supposed to have a strong affinity for self-antigens by your uh, lymphocytes. Uh, another possibility is that tumor cells are not like bacteria or viruses, especially bacteria. Bacteria don't, not only provide antigens to the immune system, but they provide accessory substances which amplify the immune response, like, for example, ligand for toll-like receptors uh, and uh, for other receptors of natural immunity. So you don't have, for example, what we call on, on, the, on the tumor cells the signal one, so this sort of uh, uh, multipotential signal for the immune system. We might have uh, low T cell precursor frequency. Uh, in other words, since these antigens are self antigen, maybe we have selected against, we are selected against, and so the repertoire in the periphery is very low, it's very small. You know, for, for bacteria, we may have hundreds of lymphocytes specific. For tumor cells, we may have one, two specific for those, since uh, these are self antigen. The other very important, very, very important aspect that has been uh, uh, discovered, uh, that has been hypothesized uh, 40 years ago, but has been uh, really uh, uh, s can, uh, dissected, I would say, dissected in the last 10 years, is the presence of other cells which slow down the immune response against tumor. Uh, regulatory cells, as we say, there they are at least uh, two strong population of regulatory cells which are implicated. One is the, the so-called Tregs. CD4, CD25 positive cells, and the other one are the myeloid suppressor cells. These 
are cells of uh, natural immunity and these are cells of uh, adaptive immunity in a sense because they are T lymphocytes. And uh, of course there are also other sort of uh, mechanisms like polarization of effector cells. We know that certain T cells, certain macrophages, if exposed to a specific milieu, they don't respond against the antigen, but they in fact uh, respond uh, uh, in a different way. Uh, they polarize the environment in which the antigen is contained in a sort of non-responder fashion. And these are, for example, TRPL2 subset and macrophages M2 subset. Uh, then we have tumor-derived antagonist molecules, so there are a lot of, uh, of cyto cytokines which uh, seems to be inhibitory for tumor, uh, for tumor recognition. And so one of these is uh, uh, TGF-beta, for example, and some other inhibitory cytokines. Uh, uh, certain uh, uh, certain uh, molecules which are uh, uh, ligands of uh, 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 receptors which are important for recognition of tumor antigens are uh, implicated in the process. But what I, uh, what I will concentrate my attention today is not on all of these things, but on some of them, and particularly to this uh, last thing, which is the low availability of tumor antigens. Low availability of tumor antigens that I will de define as, as adequate uh, uh, antigen presentation. And I, and I will explain later what is uh, this, uh, uh, this concept for me. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that you as a, as a, as a, as a postdoc or as a doctoral student should know, uh, and this is a concept which is very important in uh, neuroscience and in immunology as well, is that sometimes we are used to, you know, to concentrate to what we think is, uh, is, the, is, the, is the best thing in our world. In our world, maybe the best thing is what we're doing in our lab. Everything else is uh, not, uh, is not so, so much important as what we do in our lab. But if you think in uh, terms of uh, uh, system biology, uh, uh, you have to think that uh, any reaction, any reaction in chains is a chain reaction. Uh, uh, and it depends where you, 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 you position yourself in this sort of chain reaction. Then you will have different answers. And this is extremely true in immunology. For example, if you think that an optimal immune response requires the ending product of these uh, uh, little circles, like E7, E8, E9, and E10, you must have all these four things in order to get an immune response, an optimal immune response. Whatever the immune response is, whatever is antibacteria, antivirus, anti-tumor. So how can you obtain all of them on the same time? This is the problem of uh, the, the concept of your action, eat, and chain reaction. Uh, for example, eat, you, if you hit the immune system here uh, in the chain, you will get all these effector mechanisms, and you will get at the end E9 and E10. But you don't get E8 and E7 because you have to eat E1 also in order to get this arm of the immune response. So is there any way to get all together on the same time? If uh, this is the optimal immune response, the only way you have to get them all at the same time is to eat the precursor, okay? The precursor function, the precursor cells, whatever. But the initiator of the chain. If you eat the initiator, you will have more chance to eat everything and then getting out all the effector mechanisms that, you, uh, that uh, are required for an optimal immune response. So this is a basic consideration that is true for, immuno for immunology and is true also for neurology, for neuroscience, uh, for the immune system. You should position yourself as much as possible here or close to here. Otherwise, you don't get all the effector mechanisms. The other consideration that this theory uh, 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 brings with it is that uh, if you don't have all these mechanisms, but you only have some of them at the end, these some of them may be not necessarily useful. It may, be, it may even be dangerous. In other words, E7, E8, E9, and E10 may not be all activatory process. Some of them may be inhibitory process. And you might need the inhibitory process like E9, for example, in order to modulate the immune response. Otherwise, every time you do an immune response, at the end you get either an autoimmunity or a cancer. If you think 
to a lymphocyte as a cell that proliferates in order to get an immune response, and you don't stop the immune response, at the end they will become, will become a lymphoma, okay? Because it continues to proliferate. So that's uh, an important aspect. So <clears throat> now we go into detail of what we think uh, uh, may be important for uh, the, uh, pr the, the, the idea of conceiving a good vaccine. So if this uh, weak activation, as, any, as everybody now in science, in immunology, and in tumor immunology in particular, I is agreeing on that, is weak activation of tumor-specific T cells is the reason why we don't get strong activation of CTL. Uh, how can we provide to these cells adequate antigen availability? Uh, that I would call the 3A hypothesis, okay? We should provide adequate antigen availability. The adequate antigen availability doesn't mean only a lot of antigen. It means an antigen presented in a given way. Otherwise, it's not adequate, okay? And is this adequate necessary? And the other question is, is this adequate antigen necessary at the beginning of immune response against tumor in order to prevent the tumor? Or we might also envisage a modification of this possibility and furnish and giving adequate antigen availability when the tumor is established. In other words, can we do uh, preventive vaccination and uh, therapy uh, and therapeutic vaccination? Uh, in itself, the term therapeutic vaccination is improper, is not correct, because vaccination as definition is a preventive is a preventive strategy. But now in clinics, uh, uh, many people talk about uh, 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 therapeutic vaccination. So we will use this term, uh, but we know that it's not the correct term. So uh, can we provide enough antigen to the system? And how ca can we provide enough antigen? And the problem now is to, to focus on this. And as you see, now we're becoming much more, not holistic in science, but be, be much more focused on science. Uh, because we have to, to have uh, tools, we have to have experimental models to, to, to explain these things. So uh, the two steps in which adequate antigen availability is crucial are, of course, the antigen presentation and the recognition by TLP cells. These are the two critical steps. And uh, uh, I will give you some example of this and of this to show that you might hope that in the future this particular knowledge on tumor immunity may be useful for a uh, new vaccine strategy. Uh, we, uh, we will talk about two experimental systems that will be uh, the par paradigmatic of what I, I, I'm telling you now. So the first is system is providing adequate antigen availability by favoring the presentation of tumor antigens by the very same tumor cells to CD40 cells. What I mean of that, this is uh, anti-dogma. This is an anti-dogma for immunology. Uh, antigen presentation is exerted by, essentially by perfect antigen presented by two kinds of cells, uh, dendritic cells and macrophages. Other cells are not apt, are not adapted, are not equipped to do antigen presentation. In this hypothesis, what we do, what we will try to do is to modify tumor cells in order to get, to get them antigen-presenting cells, possibly. Uh, can we try to, uh, to confuse T helper cells by providing tumor cells which express a lot of class two antigens and then maybe can present, and let the T helper cells uh, think that those tumor cells are antigen-presenting cells? If we can confuse the helper cells in that way, maybe we, we can trigger those T helper cells against tumor antigens. But the philosophy under this approach is that the tumor antigen will be presented by the very same tumor cells. So they have the best cells to present tumor antigen. They produce them, okay? So that's the first system that I will talk to you. The second system is a system that now is very, very popular. Many people, especially, uh, especially uh, 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 pathologists, especially immunologists, especially clinic uh, uh, internal medicine, have now agreed that many of our procedures that we have used all over the years to cure or to try to cure the therapeutic procedure, like radiation, like uh, uh, 
chemotherapy produce sometimes very strong effects in terms of therapy, not because they do eliminate the tumor by a single step reaction, but because they enchain, they, they, they trigger a sort of cascade events, which have at the end the immune system that will provide the complete remission of the tumors, not the first therapeutic approach. So the second approach is based on this concept. Can we provide antigen by killing extensively the tumor cells when the tumor is already established? And this concept is what we call therapy-induced vaccination approach. Okay, this is a preventive approach and this is a therapy vaccination approach. Excuse me, uh, I need it. Okay, so how can we render a tumor cells and antigen-presenting cells? Uh, many, many years ago, when you were, many, many of you were not born, hmm? uh, in our lab uh, was discovered uh, 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 a very, very peculiar, a very strange gene at that time, which we called uh, IR1, which is not the, the fly company. It's IR1 stands for activation of immune response number one gene. This gene encodes a protein which is called C2TA, class two transactivator. This protein is a, 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 transact, is a, a regulator of transcription. It's a very complex protein. Uh, and uh, this gene, the, 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 the protein that uh, this uh, gene produces is specific for triggering the transcription of MHC class two genes. It's the most specific protein that we know for the regulation of transcription of class two genes. So once you have this gene expressed, then you have the expression of MHC class two genes. And then you have antigen presentation. What is this protein? This protein is very complex. It's not the matter of this, uh, of this talk. But just to say, just to tell you that it's a, a sort of transcriptional integrator, it acts at very different steps of transcription. It acts by binding transcription factor and rendering them uh, uh, highly affine for their pro the, the specific promoters. It acts by, by modifying the chromatin around the transcription site, by bending the chromatin in a sort of way that uh, uh, RNA polymerase can enter, can enter better into the transcription site. Acts by sort of other things. Acts also by catalyzing a, 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 a very important function for the uh, continuation of transcription, which is the hyperphosphorylation of RNA polymerase II. So it does a lot of things. At the end, what it does is to let express, express these genes in a very, very uh, uh, physiological way. Uh, now, <clears throat> what is our approach? The approach is the following. Normally, during the immune response, you have this. You have antigen-presenting cells. Okay, you have a classical antigen-presenting cell which presents antigen to TL per cells, and TL per cells help CTL that are recognizing the antigen through class one to produce their effect. This is cyto cytolytic T sort of response. Now, what we want to do is to mix up the things and take a tumor cells like a cell that express this and this together. And so, do help for TL per cell? And these T helper cells now will produce strong help against CTL. And if the CTLs are there, then they can kill the tumor cells. But what you really need is this. And this is not canonical. Tumor cells are epithelial cells, are all sorts of cells that normally do not express these molecules on their surface. So by using this gene, what we have done, we, uh, we, take, we, we have taken several tumor cells uh, we have transfected these genes into, into the tumor cells. Let these tumor cells express class two, and then ask whether the, now these, these modified tumor cells can do immunological functions, can do antigen presentation. And this is a very old work in my lab, made uh, uh, 12 years ago, now actually 14 years ago, in which by using this approach on tumor cells of, uh, of men, uh, these are uh, human adenocarcinoma cell lines, actually this was a pancreatic tumor cell line. We could show here, you see, against the specific antigens, the one you transform 
uh, these cells, they normally do not present antigens. These are tumor cells. They normally do not present antigens. By uh, transfecting with MHC, with the, with the uh, IR1 gene, now you can produce cells that they present, tumor, uh, they present antigens of any kind. These are uh, uh, mycobacterial tuberculosis antigens. So they can do antigen presentation irrespective of their own antigens. Okay. But these were antigen presentation in vitro, okay, which doesn't necessarily mean that the same thing can be done in vivo. Uh, more recently, we have done this approach also for uh, mouse tumor cells. And as you see, even for mouse tumor cells, when they are taken alone without expression of MHC, they could not present. After transfection, they can present now antigens, uh, non-specific antigen, non-tumor non antigens, to immune-specific T cells. So if you modify those, those cells and uh, you, render them, you render them MHC class 2 positive, you can show antigen presentation. Antigen presentation is the last step of uh, recognition of antigens by T cells. Or to, to better say, is the last step for an antigen presenting cell to expose the antigens. Uh, the other preliminary steps are cap uh, capture of the antigen, uh, processing of the antigen, and expressing small peptides of this protein antigen to the cell surface. So now we switch all these uh, things that we have done in vitro in an in vivo system, because if you want to to produce a vaccine, you have to show that this vaccine works in vivo. And uh, we ask all these questions. Uh, can an immune response be generated in vivo if tumor cells are induced to express MHC class 2 molecules by transfecting this uh, gene product? And if we can do that in vivo, which would be an indication of acquisition of immune response, uh, can mice injected with CTTA tumor cells reject the tumor? In other words, can be cured by the tumor. And uh, if this is generated by an immune response, does the immune response generated against these tumor cells, these genetically modified tumor cells, now protect the animals against the parental tumor, the tumor which is not transfected, which will be a proof that CTL are engaged in the process once you get TL activation. And... Uh, the other very important thing to make the system conceivable and acceptable to people that are working on vaccine and on tumor immunology is can the C2TA tumor vaccination approach be extended to different tumor types, sarcomas, carcinomas, colon carcinomas, breast carcinoma, whatever. Because if you, it will be useful already if you can apply to one single tumor cell, but if you can expand it to several distinct histotypes, then it will be even more useful. Uh, the other important aspect uh, in order to produce a vaccine is that, uh, you know, one, th one thing is to, uh, to, to, to give uh, killed bacteria or bacteria to, to a guy in order to, produce, to, to vaccinate it. One thing is to ask uh, 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 an individual, come here, uh, I give you uh, some tumor cells genetically modified. Don't worry because we know that these are vaccines. Nobody will accept, of course, and no ethical committee will allow you to pass these sort of things. If you want to show that uh, you, you, may, you, you want to produce a vaccine, you have to show that this vaccine is absolutely, absolutely innocuous for the system. So you have to show that uh, your genetic modification can apply to, to, to cells which are not alive, huh? which are not with dead cells. So if, uh, if, is there any difference in terms of protection in vaccinating animals with live replicating cells or non-replicating cells? Because all these things are applying to live replicating cells. And then the other thing is, which are the correlates uh, uh, of protection, the several correlates of protection, if we can show them. And uh, is this strategy useful also for immunotherapy approaches, and not only for, vac for preventive vaccination? So we, we, we analyze the first, uh, the first three things. Ho tempo fino a quando? Fino a cinque. OK. Um, can we generate an immune response in vivo uh, against these tumor cells? And uh, if so, can mice injected with C2DA tumor cells reject the tumor? 
and thus the immune response is generated against the tumor protect the animals against the parental tumor? These are three basic questions that are, uh, uh, that are approached uh, in a single experimental approach. And these are the results. Uh, the first result shows you by, this is uh, an histotype uh, made by fluorescent activated cell sorter, by fax analysis. The first result shows you that if you take uh, uh, the, this particular tumor cell, this is a breast carcinoma, a, a mouse breast carcinoma which normally does not express MSC class II uh, antigens. You transfect it with the C2TA, and now you see that these cells nicely express MSC class II antigens, both of the IA and the IA, IE subtypes, which are the two subset of class II antigens in the mouse. So by transfecting the gene, we can show expression, new expression, new, uh, novel expression of these markers. Now, what happens if you take these tumors and we inject them in vivo, okay? So look at this uh, particular graph. Uh, if you inject in vivo the parental tumor cells, in two to three weeks, 100% of your mice get the tumor, so get diseased, and they have to be sacrificed around the six, seven weeks. It is a very particular aggressive tumor. They have to be sacrificed after six or seven weeks. So 100% uh, of the animals get the tumor when they are injected with the parental untransfected tumor. But if you inject with the parental, with the, with the transfected tumor, you can show a very nice, uh, 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 not only uh, uh, slowdown of the tumor, but protection, total protection. So uh, more than 90% in this particular, uh, 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 in this particular case, 90% of the mice are preserved. They don't develop tumors, okay? If you take those few animals which develop tumor and you analyze the tumor size in vivo, you can show that with respect to the tumor size of the parental cells, they have a reduced tumor size. So in other words, uh, by this approach, you can relatively easily show that you can protect the animals against the, the tumor, against the grow of the tumor. Now. If you take now these protected animals and you challenge, this is the last graph, and you challenge not with the transgenic tumor, with the genetically modified tumor, but with the parental cell tumor, which is this, the tumor that, that induces 100% of, uh, uh, of tumors in, in, in the animals after two weeks, you have total protection. So the animals get immune against the transgenic tumor and also, after they are immune, they develop immunity against the parental tumor, okay? Which do not express class two. Huh? So we show protection against the, the transgenic tumor and we show acquisition of memory against the parental tumor. Now, uh, this is true for uh, adenocarcinoma, breast adenocarcinoma. Is it true for other kinds of tumors, for other histotypes of tumor? And that has been done more recently in our laboratory by, uh, by a very talented post, uh, graduate student that now left and works into a company. And so we can uh, uh, not only provide people for science, but also for, for, for practical, for companies. She's very, very, very good. Um, what uh, Valeria Frangione did in our lab was to take several different cell lines, transfect them with the MHC, uh, with the C2TA, and show that, for example, adenocarcinoma, renal carcinoma, fibrosarcoma, transfected with this uh, particular gene, now can be shown to express MHC class two genes, okay? So both C51, Renka, and Way cells can can express MHC class two genes after transfection with the tumor, with the, with the gene. And uh, now if you go on and you, uh, and you analyze the results of, uh, of uh, uh, induction of immunity, you can show that, uh, for example, for the way 164 fibrosarcoma, 100% of the, um, the animals are protected after genetic manipulation of the sarcoma. Uh, you can show that, for example, also uh, colon adenocarcinoma can uh, produce the same effect. 
uh, we have a, a strong response against other carcinoma. A little bit uh, uh, less against uh, uh, the renal carcinoma, but even if the animal developed the tumor, you see all the animals that are developed the tumor, the tumor size is very, very small compared to the parental tumor size. Okay, so also for different histotypes, and not only for uh, mammary adenocarcinoma, we can show that this application, this uh, particular approach can be useful to produce uh, reagents, cellular reagents that can vaccinate the animal, and after vaccination, the animal are protected against the, the parental tumor. Here is, a, is, a, a, is a, a nice table that shows you how you acquire memory in this uh, process. Uh, for example, for Wei, as I showed you, 100% of the animals are protected against the transgenic tumor. When you challenge against the, uh, against the parental tumor, 100% of the animals are protected. And if you do a second challenge, 100% of the animals still remain protected against the tumor. Uh, if you use the C51 uh, 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 colon carcinoma tumor model, you can show that 80% of the animals are protected. When they are protected, uh, they are challenged uh, against the parental tumor, 100% of the animals are protected. And against the second challenge, 100% of the animals are protected. And the same is true for those animals that, uh, uh, and these are the old TSA experiments, the, the mammary adenocarcinoma. So in other words, you acquire memory, you acquire re specific recognition, and this recognition is maintained over the time. Because if you challenge the animal, as you, as you do when you do vaccination, when you vaccine, for example, when you do shot vaccine against polio, then after a month you come with a second vaccination and you can show that you have a high titer of antibodies. In this case, you have uh, protection and the protection is stable and is maintained and there's acquired a memory. And up to nine months now we know, uh, we have experiments in which we have uh, immunized the mice at time zero, the animals got protected and after nine months we challenged and they're still protected. So it's a long, long memory. Okay. All the experiments that I showed you, be careful, are experiments in which we use live cells, genetically modified, and put into a mouse. Uh, these are live cells. And against these live cells, you develop immunity. Uh, and I will show you the, the cellular correlates of this immunity. Now, this is not a useful approach for vaccination in men or in humans, because you cannot, as I told you before, inject human individual, human beings with live tumor cells. Even if you are sure 100% that in my work is a vaccine, uh, nobody will allow you to do it, because this is a sort of transplantation of tumor in a body. And nobody will accept the transplantation of tumor, especially if it doesn't have a tumor, okay? So this sort of vaccination has to be now conceived with vaccine which are uh, dead vaccine. And in this case, again, we use dead vaccine, cells which are uh, deadly killed. They don't proliferate anymore. Uh, and uh, now if you put them uh, uh, you know, in vitro or in vivo, they don't get rise to tumor because they are killed. But can we use this as immunogen? Huh? Uh, can we use this as a, a non-living antigen to produce an immune response? And uh, this has been done in my laboratory by Dr. Mortara when uh, he was still with me. Uh, and uh, he, he, he showed that in fact, if you use uh, uh, tumor dead cells, C2TA tumor dead cells, and you do a sort of protocol vaccination like this one, you can easily show strong protection against challenge with parental live non MHC class 2 expressing cells. So by using dead cells which express class 2, you produce immunity against a challenge of live tumor cells. So it works very nicely. These are the control of mice which are injected with live tumor cells, and these are the control of mice which are injected with dead tumor cells. 
That tumor cell induce a little immunity, 30%, between 20 to 30% of the mice are protected. But if you use that MHC class two positive mice, then you get 80% of protection, okay? So the vaccine works at least in 80% of the cases, even with dead cells. And you need the expression of MHC class two into the tumor in order to get better protection. Now, <clears throat> Now we go to the most difficult aspect of this uh, uh, research, because now we have to deal with all these kind of cells that I show you in the scheme at the beginning of my talk, and show which, which are the correlates, or the cellular correlates of protection, okay? With the idea in mind that if what we think is correct, the cellular correlates of protection should be within the CD40 cells, huh? okay? At least within the CD40 cells. Now, <clears throat> The first approach that we did in order to show uh, what kind of cells are involved in the process was to take naive mice, so mice which had never seen the tumor, to deplete these mice by, an by antibody treatment of different subpopulation, like for example, by depleting the mice of CD8 population, which had CTL, or with CD4 population, or with other population like NK, B cells, whatever, and then ask to these mice, now, if you get injected with the transgenic tumor, can you develop tumors? It's not the regular tumor. It's the transgenic tumor. It's the CTTA-modified tumors, okay? And the answer is yes, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately for us and unfortunately for the mouse. So I show you here what happens if you deplete, for example, let's, say to, let, let, let's look to the control. If you deplete the mice of NK cells, B cells, uh, granulocytes, and then you inject these mice with the transgenic tumor, you can still show protection. So these cells are not involved in the protection, okay? Because these are, these are tumor-free, you see? You get 80%, 90% of tumor-free when you deplete from B cells, NK cells, or polymorphonucleides. But if you deplete these mice of uh, CD4 or CD80 cells, then you don't get protection anymore, which means that CD4 and CD8 are crucial to induce and to produce the protection during the vaccination process, okay? Is it clear? Okay. Uh, so that was not particularly surprising for uh, CD8 T cells because we know that CD8 are the final effectors against the tumor. But that was fundamental and very, very nice for us and very happily that we found that depletion of CD4 T cells produced the same effect. Actually, by depleting CD4 T cells, you get even a better non-protection. Huh? Because 100% of the mice now are sensitive to tumor growth and to tumor take. So CD4 T cells in the acquisition of immunity by this sort of system are crucial. If you don't have CD40 cells, then you don't get immunity against the transgenic tumor, okay? Now, uh, are cytokines involved in the process? And what kind of cytokines may be involved or what kind of subpopulation can be involved? Or, now, you have to know that one of the most important uh, cytokine in the process of antigen presentation, in the maintaining of antigen presentation, and in the process of uh, maintaining CTL activity, uh, is interferon gamma. Interferon gamma is a very potent so-called TH1 cytokine, inflammatory cytokine, that is required to optimal response against cellular antigens uh, and against certain bacteria. Now, <clears throat> if you take animals, and they, these are available in the market and av are available in the lab laboratories, if you take animals which are knockout for gamma interferon, in other words, they cannot produce gamma interferon because the, the gene has been knocked out. And uh, you ask those mice, which have T cells, but they don't produce gamma interferon, uh, are these mice uh, 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 protected? when you inject them with the vaccine against the, with the tumor cells vaccine, which is the transgenic vaccine? And the answer is no. They are not protected. They behave like 
the animals, the normal animals injected with the tumor, with the parental tumor. These are knockout animals injected with the, the transgenic tumors. And as you see, all of them in one or two weeks develop the tumor, which indicates the gamma interferon is crucial in the process of acquisition of immunity. And since gamma interferon in that system is produced essentially by two kinds of cells, NK cells and T helper cells, CD40 cells. Since NK cells have nothing to do, because I showed you that the deprivation of NK cells does not alter the immunity of the mouse, the only thing that uh, is, impo that is possibly important in this approach is that T helper cells cannot produce in the, can, do, do not produce gamma interferon, so they cannot maintain the immunity against the tumor. Okay, so again, CD40 cells. Now, <clears throat> Uh, now we show, I show you the reverse approach, okay? The reverse approach is we have a, a, a mouse that is immune, that is vaccinated. This mouse is uh, immune not only to the transgenic tumor, but also to the parental tumor. So it contains, possibly contains effector cells against the tumor. Now, can we show, as we show by deprivation of naive animals, that CD4 and CD8 are important. So can we transfer the immunity against the tumor by transferring not the tumor, but the cells immune against the tumor? So this is the approach. Uh, we produce uh, a mouse which is immune. We do a challenge to this mouse with the parental cells. And then from this mouse, we take the splint cells. We divide the splint cells. We purify the splint cells uh, in terms of CD8, CD4, or the other cell populations and we inject these cells into naive animals along with the tumor cells. And we ask these animals now, do they develop the tumor? Uh, uh, this, uh, this is the, the parental tumor, huh? it's not the transgenic tumor. Uh, do they develop the tumor when we co-inject the tumor with cells coming from an immune mice? Uh, this is a very complex aspect, but just to tell you uh, the, basic, the basic answer is yes, of course. We can show immunity when we transfer CD8 in the UAE system and when we transfer CD4 cells. So CD4 cells and CD8 cells coming from immune animals are transferring the, capa the capacity to reject parental tumor into a naive animals. This is a, a classical approach that we call win assay. So transfer, adopted cell transfer, okay? So by adopted cell transfer, both with the whey tumor and with C51 tumor, we can show protection for tumor growth. Uh, sometimes we can show total protection, sometimes we can show partial protection, and when we show partial protection, this partial protection you see is uh, very important in terms of tumor growth because the size of the tumor is very reduced compared to the size of the tumor in the parental animal which has not been injected with immune cells. So uh, we can transfer immunity by, to, by, by immune splint cells, okay? And particularly with CD4 and CD80 cells. Sorry. Okay. And CD40 cells, you see here, this is particularly true for UAE and for T TSA, CD40 cells transfer even better immunity, even better protection than CD8, which are supposed to be the effector cells. And this comes to a very important, very important aspect that I will show you after, because this is a sort of uh, other uh, dogma in immunity that this sort of approach has, in a certain sense, uh, put into discussion. Now, <clears throat> Look at this particular aspect of the histology, of the immune histology of the tumor tissue in those animals which now get in, uh, 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 injected with uh, the, trans the transgenic tumor. This is, uh, <coughs> this is the tumor tissue of the animals that are injected with the parental tumor, and this is the equivalent tumor tissue of the animals which are injected with the transgenic tumor. Uh, these are the tumor cells. And as you see into the, into the parental tumor, you don't see any CD4, for example. These are CD4, these are CD8. You don't see 
any inflammatory cells or any, if you like, I don't catch the name now, uh, uh, any cells of the, uh, of the CD4 kind until day 10. At day 10, you start, you begin to see some uh, CD4 positive T cells which infiltrate the tumor. Okay? So in the, infil in the tumor infiltrating uh, uh, cells, you don't see too many lymphocytes until day 10. If you now take the tumor cells, uh, uh, the tumor tissue uh, uh, of uh, uh, TSA transgenic tumors, then you see that after five days, five days, you begin to see CD4 T cells, which are those rounded by the, this yellow round, yellow uh, round. You can see CD4 T cells appearing. After day seven, you start to see a very interesting and uh, uh, quite unexpected aspect, which is uh, tumor necrosis. Huh? Uh, the tumor begins to be necrotic. This is an area of necrosis, and this is an area of strong infiltration of CD4, which becomes almost the, almost the total infiltrating lymphocytes into the tumor, and the tumor is not, uh, is not there anymore because you are immune against the tumor. Uh, but remember this day, day five, okay, which is quite important. If you now go to the CD8 T cells, you see you don't see CD8 all over the place uh, in the parental tumor infiltrating. Uh, tissue, whereas you see CD8 and you begin to see CD8 at day 7 and you have massive infiltration of CD8 at day, day 10. So first CD4 and then CD8. Uh, th th that is not particularly dramatic. What is very interesting is uh, this aspect. <clears throat> and uh, just forget about this too. Go to the dendritic cell population. You would imagine that uh, as in any sort of immune response, uh, 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 the presentation, the antigen presentation, optimal antigen presentation, will be given by dendritic cells. So if this is true, you should find dendritic cells early in the infiltration of the tumor tissue, okay? And uh, here, for example, if you concentrate on this and you analyze the dendritic cells that are infiltrating the parental tumor, you see some infiltrating uh, dendritic cells day five, very little, but you see strong infiltration at day seven, and uh, then uh, reduce infiltration of dendritic cells, and this is an aspect that we still uh, are investigating, very little infiltration at day 10. But if you look to tumor uh, TSA, c 2 ta to the infiltration, you see very little, and in, in, in any terms, you see much less infiltration of dendritic cells at day five that you see of CD4 at day five. And since, uh, and we calculated that there are 10 times more CD4 infiltrating cells at day five than dendritic cells. And this is important for what we think uh, is the strategy and the philosophy of all the approach that uh, maybe the antigen is presented directly by, by the tumor cells. Okay. We go, we go on because I don't want to uh, <coughs> I don't want to, uh, to, 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 to bother you with too many data. Just to say, the, uh, to, to limit the story of this diapo, these, these slides, I tell you that uh, the basic effector mechanism, the final effector mechanism of all this response is again mediated by CTL, because the CTL response is indeed the, the, the response that uh, uh, kill the tumor. But in order to have the CTL response, you have to have T helper response. Otherwise, you don't get CTL. That's the the taking home lessons that you have to get. Now, <coughs> this particular aspect here is very important because this is one of the most crucial aspects of all the story. When you... When you imagine an immune response, what you imagine is the following. Actually, it's not only imagination, but it's textbook uh, 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 reality. <clears throat> you inject an antigen. This antigen evoke uh, 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 an immune response of uh, basically of CD40 cells by antigen presentation, by dendritic cells or whatever. And if this antigen is a viral antigen, at the end you have a cytolytic response against the virus. This is the humoral response. Since tumors uh, are much more similar to a viral infected cells, and tumors are basically eliminated not by antibody, 
but by CTL. What you should expect uh, is to have CTL effects at the end, and you get CTL effects at the end. But when you do the experiments that I showed you before, the experiment of adopted transfer, and you get in this particular system, okay, when you transfer CD8, the CD8 into the animal get expanded somehow, and you have rejection of the tumor because the CTL are the final effector. So it's, it's logical to have rejection by injecting CTL. Uh, but when you inject CD40 cells, which in general are not cytolytic lymphocytes, huh? some subpopulation, very peculiar and particular population of T cells may have a cytolytic response. But in general, CTL help the other cell effects so of the immune response by giving, you know, cytokines, proliferating, uh, proliferating signal, and so on. When you inject into a naive animal, which is an animal which has never contacted the, 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 the tumor, has never had uh, stimulation of CTL by the tumor. When you inject uh, primed, as we say, primed CD4 T cells, into an animal which is a naive animal, so it's not immune. And then into these naive animals, then you inject the tumor and the tumor gets rejected by a CD8 mediated mechanism. How can you imagine that? If not, if you don't imagine that these T helper cells into an animal now have developed, and when you inject the tumor, now they allow unprimed CDA to mature and to become final effectors. What I want to say with that is that CD4 T cells can prime, can prime naive, unstimulated CTL if this CTL can see the antigens for the first time. Is that clear as a concept? Because it might be difficult, but this is a very important concept. In other words, I, don't, I have an animal which has no CTL. has only the precursor of CTL. In order to stimulate those precursors, I have to stimulate the cells. But uh, these animals have never seen the tumor. So when you inject CD8, CD40 cells, and now you come with the tumor and you get rejection, this, tum this, this is the parental tumor. The parental tumor that in, in normal, naive animals grows in 100% of those animals. And you get rejection. And this rejection is mediated by CTL. The CTL can come only by the help of the CD4 that you have injected. You see? You, you understand the point. So if this is true, then you know that you might prime CTL, naive CTL, by prime CD, CD40 cells without the need of having MHC class 2 anymore because you have the, CTL, the, the, CD8, the CD40 cells that are primed there. Okay, so this is one of the important aspects that came out of our history, of our uh, approach of anti-tumor immunology. Now, another thing, this is uh, another very complex thing that I don't want to show you. But since Marco uh, this morning uh, stimulated me in uh, asking uh, how other cells can be important into the process of uh, acquisition of anti-tumor immunity, not only in terms of uh, positive acquisition of anti-tumor immunity, but in terms of release of tumor suppressors event. And as I showed you, many cells can act as a tumor suppressor, as a, as a, uh, as a, as a immune suppressors into the system. For example, Treg, for example, myeloid-derived suppressor cell, for example, polarized TH2, and so on. So we try to investigate in this system whether one of these major, major players, which, which is called the TREG, the CD4, CD25 positive regulatory cells, can have any, any, any implication. So are these cells in the anti-tumor immunity involved because by doing these sorts of vaccination, we functionally uh, inhibit these cells or we eliminate these cells in somehow? So this table shows you what, what is the result of this sort of experiment. It's a quite uh, complex experiment, and the numbers are critical because the uh, Tregs are very, very, uh, is a very, very small population. But if you look here and you see, for example, in naive mice, in naive mice, 
what is the component of, in terms of number of T-Rex that you, that you can, uh, can, uh, can acquire, for example, from uh, draining lymph nodes. And you see that this is the number of T-Rex in, in, in a naive animal. Naive animal means uh, an animal that has never encountered the tumor. Okay? So you have 5.5%, which is the standard deviation. Now, if you go to the mice which develop the tumor, the parental tumor, the control mice, you see that this population is increased by almost, it's almost doubled. So you have uh, a movement. Uh? You have something which has something to do with the t into the tumor. Uh? Now, if you now come to those animals, always in the draining lymph nodes, that are resistant to the tumor because they are vaccinated, you see that you have a, a strong reduced number of t on those draining lymph nodes compared to the tumor carrier mice. So t diminish, and they become almost as much as the naive animal. Now, what that means? Those, are those numbers important in terms of numbers, sim a simple number, or in terms of function? So are those t that we find in vaccinated animals inhibited in their function or not? And this is the, the results of an experiment like uh, uh, the, the, the one, uh, which shows you in practical terms that those t are only reduced in numbers, but they are totally functional. So both in uh, primed animals and in vaccinated animals, those t regs are functional. They are not inhibited. It just happened that they are less in the vaccinated animals. Uh, and this less may have some correlation with the behavior of the anti-tumor immunity. You see here, the, is this, this, is, this is the approach. This is the approach to show the functionality of these t regs in vitro. And this is the approach to show the functionality in vivo. Here, the, the basic, you know, uh, one of the tests that is used in the lab to show that t regs have an inhibitory function on other t cell subpopulation, for example, on CD4, CD25 negative, which is the classical t rp cells, and to put them uh, together into an MLR, mixed lymphocyte culture. So you have T cells from uh, CD40 cell, classical CD40 cells that you put in culture with the uh, uh, spleen cells of an animal of different uh, MHC. And you produce what is called uh, uh, mixed lymphocyte uh, reaction. So the T cells respond against the allogeneic MHC and proliferate. So if into this uh, mixture you put now uh, uh, increasing amount of Tregs, you have, you see, you have diminution of this proliferation which is an important parameter to show that T-Rex works as an inhibitory function. So starting from 32 as a factor to one T-Reg and going down to two effectors to one T-Reg, you see that you decrease the possibility of these T-cells to proliferate when they are in presence of a large amount of T-Rex, two to one. Now, this is an in vitro test to show that uh, your test for T-Rex works. But this is much more important. In this test, what we have done was to inject T-Rex into vaccinated animals that are protected against the, against the, the transgenic tumor. And we show that if you inject T-Rex at this particular time after injection of the after vaccination, you show that these animals progressively acquire tumors in higher percentage, which means that if you inject enough T-Rex, this T-Rex works and they induce uh, inhibition of, all of those CD40 cells that are implicated in the process of uh, protection from tumor. So t regs are implicated, but only in terms of number and not in terms of uh, reduced function. Okay, now we go to the last approach of this uh, particular particular aspect, which is tumor vac preventive vaccination. And uh, uh, just a few slides, because I want to talk to you about the other approach. Just we'd like to show that this sort of uh, vaccination can produce effector cells that can be used in, so in uh, therapeutic 
strategies. Uh, this is the approach, it's the calcic approach. You vaccinate the mouse, you take the spleen, and then uh, you, uh, the, you use the spleen a different time after you have uh, injected the animals with the parental tumor. So you, you let the animals to develop the tumor, and you ask now if you inject uh, 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 if, if I inject a factor diminish the, the tumor growth. Now, <clears throat> until now, all the approaches have been based essentially on CTL and on the stimulation of CTL. Uh, even in men, these approach have, in effect, had a very bad uh, success. Uh, there are only transient clinical responses if you inject prime CTL. Uh, but what happens if you inject in our particular system, uh, and this is the, 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 the only slides that I want to, to show you, uh, in our particular system, which I repeat, I say again, uh, is a system that after three weeks, six weeks, uh, kill the animal by the tumor. Okay, so it's a very rapid tumor growth of those cells. Now, let me explain briefly what the system is. Uh, here we have injected the tumor cells at day, z the, the, at day zero, and then after several uh, days, after the injection of the parental tumor cells, these are the parental tumor cells, we injected the effectors, uh, the immune effectors, so if we inject, if we co-inject the tumor with the immune effectors, you have 100% of protection. That's what I showed you before. By co-injecting at the same time, the tumor doesn't grow. But uh, look at here. If you inject the tumor cells, if you inject the, 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 the effector cells, three days, six days, 10 days, and 12 days after the tumor injection, then you get strong protection, strong protection, up to seven days, up to six days. At six days, 50% of your animals are cured. They don't develop tumor at all. And those that develop the tumor have a very reduced tumor, six days. Uh, after 10 days, uh, the thing becomes a little bit uh, uh, worse. And 12 days, you don't get any protection anymore, okay? So 12 days is the limit. In, after two weeks, you cannot, even if you inject the, parental, the, the, uh, the uh, effector cells, you cannot get protection. But at six days, you can, and, and even at 10 days, you can, you can show a certain of protection. The very important thing is that this protection can be, in, uh, can be produced by CD4 T cells, okay? Here, you see? If you inject CD4 T cells, CD4 T cells can do the job alone uh, into the tumor. Again, saying that if you get enough helper T cells, even in an animal that cannot rescue CTL, then the CTL are rescued, just providing CD40 cells. Okay. Uh, the conclusion of this first part, and I will go very fast to the second part, which I have only 12 minutes, uh, is the following. You can uh, uh, produce tumors of distinct histotypes that ha can be rendered rejectable in vivo by transfection of C2TA. So this tumor operationally behave like an antigen presenting cells of their own tumor antigens in vivo. C2TA tumor vaccinated mice reject parental untransfected tumors and generate tumor specific long lasting T cells, both of CD4 and CD8. Immune effectors generated by vaccination with this particular transgenic tumors are capable to cure and or significantly reduce the growth of established tumors. CD40 cells are remarkably more efficient than CD8 in this particular aspect. So that's why we believe that the, the trick, uh, the story resides on the importance of CD4 and then on the importance of antigen presentation. And the major anti-tumor immune cells generated by vaccination approach, uh, these uh, use for adopted cell therapy, uh, display that I didn't show you, but just to, to make the story short, display a TH1, TH2 mixed phenotype. 
which, uh, um, which is quite uh, clear that is a common phenotype, a protective phenotype, because people believe that the protective phenotype for antitumor response is only TH1. This is not true. There are now many, many evidence that the protective phenotype of the CD40 cells are mixed phenotypes, TH1, TH2. Okay, now, <clears throat> just a few words on the second system, because I believe that the second system is, is even, in certain aspect, is complementary to this and is uh, extremely important, because uh, relies also to, uh, uh, to uh, and can give uh, a different interpretation of what we now conceive as tumor therapy. Okay. Now, the system is now based on the fact that we try to provide adequate antigen availability in, uh, in a system in which the tumor is already there, and we try to kill the tumor. And by killing the tumor, we believe and we think that we can provide more antigen. So if this is true, we should have a system, like, for example, radiation therapy, like chemotherapy, like biological therapy, and the example that I will show you is a biological therapy, in which we can distinguish between tumor necrosis from tumor immunity, okay? Because everybody believes that when we do therapy, we produce tumor necrosis, okay, or tumor, ap tumor apoptosis, whatever. But that the, the, the phenomenon is closed on that, okay? So if we cure a tumor by, uh, by cyclophosphamide or whatever, by, by melphalan, by, we always believe that we kill the tumor cells and we eliminate the tumor cells. But uh, maybe this is not the reality of the, of the subject. And now there are many, many evidence that in order to eliminate the tumor by, by classical approach, you need also an immune response, okay? So what is the approach? The approach is to use uh, this very famous cytokine, which is called tumor necrosis factor, and that has been discovered because it uh, was a necrotic factor for tumors. That was why it was given the name of TNF, as uh, uh, Reiner also explained to you uh, in, the, in the lecture before. Now, <clears throat> this approach has, has been conceived in Genova, uh, the Institute of Cancer Research in Genova, by Luciano Zardi and Laura Borsi, and is based on a very basic, uh, uh, very basic evidence. Uh, TNF is a tumor necrotic cytokine, but TNF alone cannot be used as a therapeutic approach because uh, when you inject uh, tumor necrosis factor in order to kill a tumor uh, intravenously, the first thing you do is to kill the individual because tumor necrosis factor is highly toxic. Okay? So the, the only approaches that has worked until now by using tumor necrosis factor as, a, as an anti-tumor agent is to inject TNF into the tumor and hoping that it doesn't go systemically because if it goes systemically, you kill the animal. You kill the animal, you kill the, the person. So uh, uh, Luciano Zardi thought that uh, if, we, if we may vehiculate TNF in the side of the tumor, maybe we will have a better action of the TNF within the tumor, okay? So how to vehiculate, how to, to, to travel TNF into the tumor and not to let them go around, let them go around and produce toxic effect. So <clears throat> uh, many years ago, 10 years ago, Luciano Zardi and Laura Borsi made a very interesting observation that uh, during vascularization, because neovascularization of the tumor is a pathological event, during neovascularization, uh, the uh, extracellular matrix produces a sort of a fibronectin, which has a, a, an additional uh, domain, which is not present in normal fibronectin. So this is, a, if you like, a pathological domain of fibronectin. So against this pathological domain of fibronectin, which, he, which is present only in the neovascular neo formation, he made antibodies. And then this antibody were bound to TNF to produce what is called L19, uh, L19 TNF complex. So this L19 complex is made by an antibody against fibronectin, so it goes only into the neovasculature, and the TNF. By doing this way, you can vehiculate the TNF there where there is neovasculature. And since the tumor is a neovasculature tissue, it can preferentially go there. Uh, that was the approach, okay? 
So, okay, this is all the molecular biology of uh, the construct, and this is the effect, and as you hear, this is the work of uh, Luciano and uh, Laura Borsi in uh, 203 in blood, and as you see, when you, when you, when you inject L19 TNF alpha into, uh, into the tissue, into the, the mice, then you see that this TNF alpha L19 is localized close to the neovascular uh, tissues of the tumor and kills the tumor. Now, when you talk about TNF, you always have to remember that TNF is a very, very peculiar cytokine that has a lot of effect. Eh? I don't go all those, these effects because there are so many. It's a pleiotropic cytokine, one of the most pleiotropic cytokines that is known. Um, has several effects. Now, these several effects are more or less uh, uh, schematized in these slides eh, to make it more clear. So TNF produces direct tumor cell killing, and this direct tumor cell killing is, is generally mediated by apoptosis. TNF uh, increases vascular permeability, okay? Uh, and by increasing vascular permeability, allows uh, s toxic substance, substance for the tumor coming out from the vasculature and going into the tumor. Uh, produce intravascular coagulation, and this is a very important aspect because by producing intravascular coagulation, of course, uh, you don't give uh, uh, juice uh, to the tumor, you don't give uh, 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 food to the tumor, and the tumor uh, is killed by, by thrombosis, necrosis for thrombosis, okay? And the other thing that uh, uh, very importantly, very important TNF does is that it, it upregulates adhesion molecules. And these adhesion molecules, especially in the lymphatics, may be important for, uh, I think, uh, may be important for things that we'll see in, in, in a while. Okay, so uh, the approach that was conceived at that time was to inject uh, TNF alpha L L19 complex with melphalan. Melphalan is a very toxic substance for tumors, as you say, it's a chemotherapy. Uh, because melphalan uh, uh, kills directly the tumor cells, and melphalan can get out of the blood circulation, preferentially when TNF exerts its action as a, uh, uh, increasing the, the vasculature, um, um, increasing the, the vasodilatation of the, of the vasculature. So, <clears throat> look at this slide. Uh, when we start the collaboration with the group, of uh, Luciano, these was, were the results, uh, very important results. If you use uh, L19 TNF along with melphalan, you can show strong therapeutic effect of established tumors. 80%, uh, between 60 to 80% of the tumor, of the, of the mice are protected against the tumor. Are, they, they are cured from these established tumors. They are cured, okay? So this is a very important thing. If you use, for example, only melphalan, or only L919 TNF, the effect is much less important. You still reduce the, uh, the tumor masses, but the mice eventually die from the tumor. The important thing is this aspect. The combination of uh, TNF alpha and melphalan produce a very strong biological effect in terms of cure. Now, uh, at that time, nobody was thinking that this cure was indeed immunologically mediated as well. And in fact, we discovered that it was uh, immunologically mediated just a few, few, few years after when we, we start to collaborate with Luciano. Because if you take the same approach, huh, the approach that protects 80%, that cure 80% of the animals, and you do it in uh, immuno, immunodeficient animals, then you can show that uh, the approach, the therapeutic approach doesn't work anymore. And eventually, with one or two weeks of delay, the animals get uh, die, eh? die from the tumor. So there is no protection against the tumor. So the only difference between these two approaches is that this is an, immuno, an immunocompetent mouse and this is an immunodeficient, deficient mouse. So we went all, the, all through the story, and just to make the story short, we could demonstrate that in fact, when you have mice cured by this approach and you challenge the mice now with the second challenge of the tumor, you produce a rejection in 100% of these mice. So the mice which were cured 
can reject the tumor. And a, 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 a first, a second, and even a third challenge with the tumor without any therapy anymore. So that was very similar to what we got with our vaccination approach in which we created the memory. So if this rejection was immunomediated, then we could show possibly that the uh, uh, immune cells were originated by a therapeutic approach, okay? A single therapeutic approach. And what we did was the same approach as we did before. And just to make the story short, we did both, both by deprivation of naive, uh, 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 of naive mice, na mouse subpopulation of CD8 and CD4, or by, uh, uh, <clears throat> or by cell transfer, adopted cell transfer with the immune population. And interestingly, if you, the, the, if you deprive the, the animals of CD4 and CD8, but not of NK, you produce, the, those animals cannot be cured anymore, okay? So the therapeutic approach doesn't work anymore because you see, without CD40 cells, those animals don't get cured from the tumor. Without CD80 cells, those animals don't get cured from the tumor. So what was conceived as a therapy, as non-specific therapy of the tumor by TNF and melphalan, is indeed a therapy which produces an immunity, and this immunity is responsible of cleaning up, cleaning up the tumor from, this money, from these animals. So that's why we call it therapeutic uh, th therapy, therapy induced tumor vaccination. So the animal get vaccinated. And if you take those animals which are protected and then you inject them, as I showed you before, with tumor, they get protected. They are protected. They don't develop the, mind, the, the tumor anymore. We did the other approach by transferring immune, I mean, spleen cells from animals that were cured and trying to see whether these spleen cells could confer protection. And again, even in this case, we could confer even total protection by total spleen cells by CD4, and particularly by CD4, better than by CD8. So this is a proof that, uh, now I show you the final, uh, the final uh, model of what we think. This is a proof that uh, even therapy, what we consider as non-specific therapy, is indeed uh, important for rescuing the immune system in a specific way in such a way that now the immune system could respond itself against the tumor without the need of having farther, farther therapy. Uh, so the idea now, this is the scheme that I showed you before on the effect of TNF. Of TNF. Uh, the idea now is the following, that by producing all this massive uh, necrosis of the tumor, we provide more antigens to the immune system, and this antigen which now gets out of the tumor cell can be, can be picked up by dendritic cells. In this case, they are not C2TA modified cells. These are the animals with its own antigen presenting cells. Can be picked up by dendritic cells. These dendritic cells now are filled up of uh, tumor antigens. They go into the lymph nodes, they stimulate lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes now get go back through the circulation, go into the into the, the vessels, go in the vessels that uh, are in the tumor, produce anti-tumor immunity, eliminate the tumor cells which are not eliminated by therapy, and they produce memory. And if this tumor would rise again in the future, this tumor will be eliminated not by the therapy, but by the lymphocytes. That's why you don't see the tumor anymore, okay? So you don't need the therapy anymore. So this <coughs> goes to the, my final slide, which is the following. What we really believe is important and fundamental in tumor immunology is this step, antigen presentation, okay? Antigen presentation and rescue of the helper cells. Without this, this step optimally induced, you, don't, you will not have any success in any sort of uh, vaccination therapy against tumor. This, uh, this rescue system, this sensitization system, this stimulation system, if you like, can be, can be increased by the idea of providing more antigen to the system. But this antigen has to have peculiar characteristic. 
One characteristic can be given by modifying the tumor cells with C2TA and render the tumor cells themselves antigen-presenting cells. That will rescue T helper cells, and by rescuing T helper cells, you now get all the, all the chain reaction. The, this is the first it. You get all the chain reaction, including lymphocytes, including subver subversion of the tumor tissues, including CTL, everything, providing that you, that you have this preliminary and initial step. And you get immune-mediated tumor rejection. The same thing can be provided by therapeutic approach. And now here in my slides, I show you also this because there is plenty of literature, literature now on this particular aspect. If you treat the tumor cells with uh, radiation, chemotherapy, biological therapy, what you actually are doing to the system is not to kill fully the tumor cells, but to kill enough tumor cells to provide enough tumor antigen and get into the system again by this way, because otherwise you cannot show why this sort of uh, application gives you tumor memory, immune memory. And this is what uh, we are actually working on, and we are trying to uh, understand more the basic of this phenomenon and hoping with the Marco also we are very strongly collaborating on the neuroimmunological aspect of these cells to render them as much as possible even better performance against, uh, against tumors. And uh, thank you very much for, for these things. These are, these are the collaborators that have been working or are working in my laboratory on this aspect, particularly Valeria Frangione, uh, Lorenzo Mortale, Andrea De Lerma, and Giovanna Tosi, and these are the collaborators that have been enriched. The, 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 the work uh, uh, from different approaches in uh, different laboratories, in particular the group of Silvano Ferrini in the Tumor, in, in the Tumor National Institute in Genova, the group of uh, Luciano Zardi and Laura Borsi, again in Genova, uh, the Center of Biotechnology, Advanced Biotechnology Center in Genova. And, uh,